This should be played at high volume, preferably in a residential area. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time! Oh, no. Oh, yeah! I finished these fights. Give me a hell yeah! Top Rope Nation. Learn to love it! It's the best thing going today. What's up, wrestling fans? The Top Rope Nation crew has joined together in the great state of Iowa. Kyle Ross hit the road this week. He traveled, I don't know, Kyle, how many miles is it to Iowa from Cleveland? Well, take the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, as the crow flies, probably hundreds something. But I mean, we took the scenic route all the way up through Wisconsin, Minnesota, and back down. So I don't know how long we tried. So it was, I don't know, it's 11 hours to Minnesota and then three and a half more down. So I don't know, 14 and a half hours. Yeah, it was, You're the it was teacher. Five, it was 500 <laughs> miles probably. 500 miles. I don't know. If you guys hear a bunch of uh, static and noise, we are passing around a single microphone right now because we actually all brought our microphones had a little bit of technical difficulty. We could not plug them all in. So we're passing around a mic like we're Boy Scouts passing around the mic at story time at night around the campfire telling stories. And uh, it's going to work. So we are here to do our first ever live cast all together here. Uh, we'll be talking all the latest in pro wrestling and uh, mostly news this week, I think. Um, we're going to talk about has fake news hit the professional wrestling industry. So before we get started, if you like the show, go ahead, hit subscribe on iTunes. Uh, go ahead and rate us five stars. It helps us out, gets us ranking higher in the professional wrestling podcasting rankings. And uh, Kyle just gets really excited whenever we get a five-star rating popping up there. He likes it. So go ahead and do that. Um, and we are here every week, usually on Fridays. We've got a new show for you. This week, it's a day delayed because, like I said, we wanted to get Kyle live in studio, and actually Justin here, Justin Joint on the line. Justin has never been live in studio with me, even though we live in the same town. And it's probably a good thing, because uh, we would have had some te technical problems if we tried to do that. So, <laughs> Justin, how's it going tonight? Good. I feel like uh, this is a in-ring promo from a faction. You know, everybody's taking their turns doing their bits. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, seriously, we're all going to rotate, Kyle. Yeah, we're all going to wait for the other person. It's so natural. Let the other person finish what they're saying. Okay, now I'll talk. You talk. I got Vince McMahon, got Vince McMahon in my ear telling me what to say. Yeah. And then Justin talks. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm real psyched to be here. Good. Yeah, what, is, what a wonderful studio, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, ne I've never been to a state, a state like this before. <laughs> You've never seen so much corn in your life. Yes, um, the studio is presently a townhouse that I am just living in part-time, so it's kind of a makeshift studio, but we'll make it work tonight. So uh, I said a second ago, Kyle and Justin, has fake news hit the professional wrestling industry? And that comes from a feud we see going on with our guy Big Dave Meltzer and Eric Bischoff. And so Kyle, this is actually very timely because you were actually at the site of the first Nitro just a few days ago, the great Mall of America in Minneapolis, actually Bloomington, Minnesota, I believe. Is that right, Megan? Yes, my wife is from Minnesota. She's off, off mic here. Her first appearance in Top Rope Nation. <laughs> so Bloomington, Minnesota, the site of the first Monday Nitro in 1995, September of 1995. And they got into a Twitter spat because, well, actually, Kyle, why don't you take it from now? Tell me, where'd this fake news story come from? Well, I don't know. I just, the fake news thing is, is a larger issue. But if anyone wasn't looking at their TL, I think, I guess it was yesterday. It was. I've been on the road, so I, I was playing catch up. Bischoff takes umbrage with Meltzer claiming or at least giving the credit to Zane Bresloff, who was a promoter who did a lot of great things for WCW when he came over from WWF, um, you know, kind of alongside Hogan in 94. And he, he takes umbrage with the notion that it was Zane Bresloff's idea and Zane Bresloff's idea only to hold the first night charm all of America. Bitch, I was like, oh, I'm from Minnesota. I knew all about it. Knew it would be a great sight. So I'm just looking at this stuff and I'm snickering as the, Meltzer and Bischoff are going back and forth. And really, it, it's not productive and no one's learned anything. But it got me to thinking, you know, it goes to Bruce's pro podcast with 
Bruce Pritchard's podcast with Conrad Thompson as well. That, and now with Bischoff doing the 83 Weeks gig, is the goal of those podcasts, it seems, solely to discredit Meltzer and make Meltzer, you know, it's like the old Donald Trump, Meltzer's fake news, because he gets this one thing wrong. But it's really funny if you listen. Now, I've listened to more Bruce than I have Eric, um, and I... I had this fear when Bischoff, when the 83 Weeks podcast started, that its goal was going to be, well, let's just, you know, talk about what Meltzer said wrong in The Observer and just make fun of that rather than, you know, inform and entertain the listeners. Um, you know, Bruce kind of started doing that and Bischoff's taken it to the nth degree. But if you listen to, like, Bruce, like, a lot of times he agrees with Meltzer, but he seizes on that one time he was wrong and uses that to attempt to discredit all you know, quote unquote wrestling journalists or the quote unquote dirt sheets. And man, that's not an entertaining gimmick to me. It just isn't. And look, I've got a lot of problems with Melson Observer. I I texted a buddy on Wednesday. I'm on the road. I, I read it on Thursday morning. I think the new Observer, quite honestly, was about as uninformative, uninspired, and boring as any edition I've ever read in the, you know, 20 years I've been reading it. But that doesn't mean that, you know, he's fake news he being Meltzer I got a good segue for Justin here so um so you mentioned well you got the Bruce Pritchard podcast you got the Eric Bischoff podcast and the bridge between is Conrad right he's on both of them correct so Justin I think we started talking about the Bruce Pritchard podcast like maybe a year ago and you got really into it and on that podcast they're always like like uh Kyle was saying Bruce really kind of attacks Meltzer a lot, you know, and you've always been someone that kind of pays attention to the wrestling rumors. We talked about it, you know, growing up together here around town and everything. Um, has that impacted your opinion of Dave Meltzer listening to that podcast or do, do you trust what Dave Meltzer says or where do you get your trustworthy news stories from? Uh, mostly Kyle Ross and Ryan Drossy. That's where I get all my, my news from. Um, I think it's all a bit the the slam in on Dave Meltzer. They wouldn't use him as their primary source for storytelling if they didn't, or at least if Conrad didn't have faith in him. Um, I think Bruce is just playing it up. You know that they, they sell those rumors and innuendo shirts. You know they're making money off of uh, the Bruce Pritchard character hating on Dave Meltzer. So I I don't think there's a lot there, and I have no opinion on Eric Bischoff. I I, I think he's probably 50% right. Cause, um, they just had a rebuttal episode on talk is Jericho where Jericho, you know, discredited half of what, you know, Eric Bischoff said. So I don't know. It's, we're all getting worked all the time. <laughs> yeah. And that's something to do. You know, Bischoff is not exactly the greatest reference point. It really needs to be said again. I'm not the first person who said that it's by any means, but this is a guy who had, in my opinion, the most talented roster of any promotion in history in 1998, was fired in 1999, and that company was out of business by 2001. I mean, go look at the roster, the WCW roster in 1998. People who love the fantasy book, have fun with that. I mean, it's incredible what they had. Not only did they have all the stars from the past, they had all the guys who would go on to be stars in the future. Yeah. I mean, is talented in ring as the current WWE roster is? And, you know, as many headaches as the 1998 WCW roster cost? It's not close. The 1998 WCW roster, I mean, it's very bloated. It's insane, the names they had. And for, you know... Bischoff doesn't probably get enough credit for the work he did early on when he took over because, you know, you know, 95 is not my favorite year to watch from either of the big two, but particularly WCW until Nitro kicks off. And, you know, obviously a lot of people lament the second half of 94, the Hogan love-in, because the, the first half of 94 was so great. But, you know, Bischoff did do a lot of good things initially. But, man, I mean... The NWO got going, and he rode that for a long time, and he just didn't have another good idea. He lucked into Bill Goldberg, and he didn't. He couldn't even make that work. Once they got the, I mean, he was smart enough to put the title on him, but he certainly didn't know how to book him as a champion. And again, 
It's not all Bischoff's fault. Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash deserve a lot of the blame for the downfall of that company. They were in his ear. So I just, I don't know. I just, the fake news came to mind because, like, that's the whole thing. It's like, it seems like, you know, Bruce has fun with it. Like, I guess, but Bischoff, there was a nastiness to it. And anyone who's read Controversy Creates Cash, I think on what, like, page, like, 20, maybe even sooner, he makes it a point to say, you know, how much he hates the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. And this was, you know, well, well, that book was written when? Like, at least 10 years ago. Like, 2006, I think. Yeah, I was going to say 05 or 06. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just think there's a, like, oh, like, and it, it's just, I don't know, to me, it's just not fun. And Pritchard can make it kind of fun. But Bischoff, I, I, there's just a nastiness to it that is just, is very bad. It's very bad. 83 yeah. weeks. And, and, like, you know, like, you know, again, 83 weeks. I mean, fine. You beat WF for 83 whole weeks in the ratings. But, you know, what about, you know, the next 83 weeks? You did a real lot. Like, I, I'd rather hear that podcast. You know? <laughs> Let's talk about what all the stupid things you did over those that next 83 weeks, Eric. So, I don't look. I got a lot of problems with Meltzer. But, uh, you know, I saw a lot of people were saying, you know, again, you look at our country as a whole. Journalism under fire. Um, it, it's, you know. It's, it's 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 stupid. It's a stupid gimmick, really. Um, you know, wrestling can be silly and pretty meaningless, but like, I just I just don't like the gimmick at all. And I wanted to, I, I saw it on my timeline, and I didn't like it. Well, besides, of course, Ryan Drosty at PopCulture.com, is there any wrestling journalist? A little self plug there. Is there any wrestling journalist more respected than Dave Meltzer across the board? Can you guys think of anybody more respected than I mean he is like the chief historian of pro wrestling would we all agree I like Bruce Mitchell as a columnist yeah. it's a little different but um yeah I mean Meltzer's the go-to name and yeah he gets stuff wrong but like everyone gets stuff wrong yeah. you know I mean, Eric Bischoff gets a lot wrong yeah you know yeah yeah I I think I kind of agree with you guys I think Pritchard kind of plays it up on the pod if if they didn't respect Meltzer they wouldn't be using it his observer newsletters as like <laughs> the table of contents for every <laughs> podcast they do where they're always verbatim reading out of the, out of the observer so yeah that's a great point yeah you know like that's how the whole thing is like this is what Meltzer was you know, reporting on and yeah I mean it's you know yeah it's just silly so, also, since we're talking about Meltzer, um, they were talking to the Observer this week about what's going on with the Universal title picture, and you kind of see what's happening with them trying to get sympathy for Roman Reigns again. So, I guess the story is that they're trying to make Brock into the bad guy. Brock is actually literally holding the title hostage now. Like he, They can't get him on TV. Um, they can't make an agreement for a title defense at SummerSlam. There's even a report, I think, out there from uh, Mike Johnson on PW Insider claiming that uh, Lesnar will not work SummerSlam this year, which I kind of find that hard to believe. Second biggest pay-per-view of the year. How do you not have Brock Lesnar there? As much money as they're paying him. Um, but I guess the other side of the story was they only have so many appearances left for him, perhaps, and uh, they're trying to make the best use out of them, but wouldn't SummerSlam be one of the best uses you could get out of uh, Brock Lesnar? So how do we feel about, I know we've talked about this on the podcast a lot. How do we feel about them going back to Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar yet again? Because I think we were all at WrestleMania in New Orleans and we saw the fan response. I mean, ambivalent, I guess would be an understatement. People just really didn't care about the match. I don't think that this storyline is going to work at all. I don't think that's going to get sympathy on Roman Reigns, even if they, you know, pretend that Brock is holding the title hostage. Uh, I don't think anyone really buys that. And so what's the best story if they're going to keep on with this Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar saga? What's the best angle they could take going into SummerSlam, assuming that they do the match at SummerSlam? I see Kyle motioning for the mic. Okay. You mentioned we were there for WrestleMania. And you didn't need to be there for WrestleMania to answer these questions. I'm going to ask you guys each a question here. And I think the answers are pretty simple. Okay. Justin, is there anything, in your opinion, anything short of, like, Brock Lesnar beating people, like, actually beating people up in the crowd or, like, you know, wishing death on family members? Even that may not do that. But is there anything they can do to get the Brooklyn crowd to cheer for Roman Reigns against Brock Lesnar in a traditional babyface way, in your opinion? No. Okay. Ryan Drosty. Let's listen. There's 
you know, Meltzer's talked about that and in other places reported that the plan might be for Roman to beat Brock at SummerSlam and then for Braun to immediately cash in on Roman, you know, with his Money in the Bank briefcase. If they did that, is that not the all-time biggest political hit on Roman Reigns of all time in an admission that this babyface thing isn't working? Yes. Okay. So what are we doing? You asked, oh, what's the best plan? I've said this before. They've already missed the boat, in my opinion. The best story Raw could have told was Seth Rollins getting the babyface position against Brock Lesnar and Roman either as a Money in the Bank winner coming in and stealing the title that way or just costing Seth the title and either way becoming a heel. Because, you know, let's just look at things logistically, whatever you think of Roman. They need heels on Raw. They need top heels. We could talk about some guys. But they're not... I don't think they're going to do that story, it doesn't seem, because, you know, Seth seems kind of married to, to Ziggler at this point. So, to me, I'm just, you know, WWE stock literally couldn't be higher right now. It's at an all-time high. But I, I this universal title picture, I mean, they have just got to get the title off Brock Lesnar. This whole Roman coordination thing is not working. They should have done it years ago and just roll with it like they did with Cena, and he can grow into the position or not grow into the position as it may be. But these options are just, they're not going to work. And like I just think they're counterproductive. Like the Braun thing, okay, fine, Brooklyn goes home happy. Well, you just massacred Roman Reigns as your top baby face. I mean, just completely castrated him. So I just, and you're basically then admitting, okay, we, we want a baby face reaction. So we're going to have Braun cash in on Roman Reigns. Well, then what are you doing trying to get Roman Reigns over in this baby face role? Very frustrating. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the multi-person match, whether, you know, it's apparently still on uh, for extreme rules, according to local advertisements. But yeah, uh, I don't know. thoughts, I guess. So this has got to be, because they basically already tried this at WrestleMania. They're just redoing this exact same thing four months later. This has got to be one of the most tone-deaf things the WWE has ever done. Um, and as far as Roman Reigns turning heel, you know, they, they, they'll they say they'll either say, well, isn't he already heel? Or, well, the, the second he turns heel, he's just going to start cheering. You, isn't that better than just complete freaking indifference from the crowd and you know playing with their beach volleyballs i mean look at uh money in the bank his match with gender the, any major wrestling city that's the reaction you're going to get from roman reigns until they do something completely different with him yeah no yeah he's a lost cause at this point i think any people will say well he went to chicago hardcore smart crowd right well brooklyn's gonna be the same thing and honestly smarks have almost overtaken every single television wrestling crowd at there, this point there is not a casual wrestling audience like yeah. there used to be yeah so i was gonna read this section i wrote about this on uh, comicbook.com which is a segment of pop culture the other day and i said to be blunt, the idea that this will work any better at getting the fans behind Reigns versus what happened during WrestleMania season seems like a fantasy. Both Strowman and Rollins seem like far more logical babyface choices to take the belt from Lesnar, as they both have a groundswell of support surrounding their characters and have for the last several months. With Reigns, the fans are completely ambivalent, and that's not likely to change without some sort of massic, massive character restructuring, which, honestly, I don't know what that would be. Um, but I kind of agree a full on heel turn at this point would probably be best for him if they could do that. Cause it at least would be a little bit fresh. I don't even know. Like, cause there is an, an argument and, and there is some truth to it that if they quote unquote, turn him heel, that it will be giving the crowd what they want. You know, like we saw on Monday with the Bailey heel turn, the crowd cheered for it mm -hmm. probably because that storyline has been so bad that they were just happy to see some progression. And that, that, that's common in the modern wrestling fan. People just cheer for booking they want to see. I don't actually think you would need to change Roman Reigns' character at all to be a heel. He would just have to screw a baby face over, like Rollins. That's why, and you would just get everything set. Like, I don't think he needs to come out necessarily and cut heel promos, you know, come out and Raw and be like, I'm going to cut the promo you guys on the internet have wanted me to cut for three years. Like, that would actually be terrible if he did that. But you know, I just think that they're putting him in this 
if we went through the two scenarios, okay, you're right. It's going to be ambivalence or anger if they have him be the conquering hero who topples reigns. That's not good. And if you want him in that position, though, and you have him victimize, beat Reigns, uh, Lesnar finally, and victimized by the Strowman cash in, well, you've, again, castration. Complete castration. So I, I don't understand those booking options, quite frankly. Um, if they want to do a, Le- a Strowman cash in, I'll be honest with you, I think it's better to have Bobby Lashley win at Extreme Rules and be the contender. And he either. I, he doesn't even. He wouldn't even need to beat Lesnar in that situation. And by the way, here's another thing, too. If Brock, let's say Brock lost to Roman, Roman loses via cash in. You totally minimize the, the Lesnar loss, so he better be doing another job out the door. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that, that that's a whole other ball of wax, in my opinion. Yeah. Dead or passing. Yeah. Um. How did just time feels like a flat circle? Because while you were talking about, you know, doing a brawn cash in, my brain went right to the first time Roman Reigns won the title and got cashed in by Sheamus. Mm-hmm. So once again, they've done this over. It's almost like they are legit just trying to beat us into submission. <laughs> Roman is like the eternal bridge champion. <laughs> He's bridging the gap to the next guy. Yeah. Um, Boy, and it, I, I'm not the Segway guy, but, you know, time is a flat circle. You know, we recently saw the reformation of Team Hell No. It's like they're they're just running everything back. I was actually, that's funny. I was going to go to that next, actually, because I wanted to talk about the SmackDown title picture and where you guys were at with the Team Hell No stuff. Because I think there's a couple ways of looking at it. You could look at it like nostalgia. It was kind of cool to see them reunite. But then at the same time... I feel like if you're a hardcore Daniel Bryan fan, then you feel like he's even further away from the singles championship. Is that what you thought, Justin? Yeah. Um, I, you kind of said, you know, the nostalgia of seeing Team Hell No, it's a nice moment. Kane doesn't do anything for me anymore. Um, and boy, I, I can't help but see this and think that they – might not think Brian's going to re-sign. I mean, this is the kind of thing you do if if he's not going to going to re up on a contract cuz there's so much more interesting stuff you can do putting him in a program with, you know, any of the talented guys on that SmackDown roster. Glass half full and my no longer is. What what water in Iowa by the way? Unbelievable water in this state. Um glass half full is okay, you're delaying the Miz thing. And like if he does resign, okay, that could be potentially good storytelling if you keep him further apart and the crowd's really engaged when they finally, um, you know, do feud proper. I think if you're a Brian fan, the other issue is okay, does Kane turn on Dana Bryan and that's like a singles feud yeah. for like a month? For like a month, and they have Brian beat Kane. Like you're right, it it's an okay one off if Team Hell No, but you know. Like, are Team Hell No going to be the tag team champions? Like, it's a tag team title match. And I don't really see them booking Daniel Bryan as one half of the tag team champions. And and this, the whole thing with will he or won't he resign is key. I mean, that's really, you know, Daniel Bryan, to be fair, is very much the Brock Lesnar of SmackDown right now where he's holding all the cards. You know, whether or not he resigns, that basically determines the next nine months of Smack, the SmackDown brand. Yeah, I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago on the show, and he hasn't signed a new contract. Most people expect him to sign a new contract. Um, I talked about on the show three or four weeks ago that I thought there was somewhat of a chance. I could see an argument for him not re-signing just um, based on wanting to live out you know, some fantasy outside of WWE. He just talked about wanting to work uh, AAA in Mexico, for example, New Japan, uh, seeing what the Young Bucks are doing, Bullet Club, all of that. Uh, there was a report from PW Insider today that said WWE currently has no plans to make Brian uh, a main eventer, really, um, or in like the title picture because he hasn't re-signed, which logically makes sense. Um, so to answer your question, Kyle, I actually do think there is a, a slight chance they could win the tag team titles. We also talked about on the show how the Bludgeon Brothers have lost a lot of steam recently. So you could almost see... 
that they would do a title switch and you know Kane gets some publicity out of it he's he's for sure going to win that mayoral race in Tennessee but uh he's still campaigning for that and it gives Brian a title I guess without getting him in the world title picture um but man we've talked about it. we want to see Daniel Bryan wrestling for the WWE championship at SummerSlam it feels like you get from WrestleMania to SummerSlam it's time for him to be in that title picture but if he hasn't resigned it's not going to happen and i don't even know where they're going with the title picture on smackdown right now do, you, do either of you have any inclination where they could possibly be going first off glenn jacobs is no alexandria ocasio cortez okay i, I got it let's let, let's get that out of the way first um yeah you know there was a report i read that and this is like very old school so i don't know how much stock i put in this that they want aj to keep the world title through the release of the video game which is october just because he's on the cover that seems like real like like oh, yeah, yeah. yeah i mean is any is, is are really are there really like people out there who are not going to buy the video game because aj styles is no longer the smackdown champion justin, justin is raising his hand my god i, I don't believe it <laughs> but so i don't know about but you're right and wwe is actually right you you can't invest daniel bryan as a main eventer if he leaves and so, I mean, I don't know what those negotiations are like, but, you know, you, you can't do it. Um, you probably want to, again, like Lesnar, you want to beat him out the door, probably, and you want to have Miz be the guy to do that. So, um, yeah, I guess, I mean, that'll be interesting to see. I guess we'll get a pretty clear picture after Extreme Rules because if they do win the tag team titles, we're not getting Miz and Bryan at SummerSlam unless I don't think they would put that in a tag team program. No you guys? No, nope, that's it. No great yeah. <laughs> <laughs> greatest pay per view <laughs> intro of all time. Great balls of fire. I think we used that on the podcast last summer like two or three times at least. I got to play Jerry Lee Lewis on Top Rope Nation, which was very nice. So, yeah, no, I, I actually wanted to bring that up as a topic because I have no idea what AJ Styles is going to be doing at SummerSlam. Um, yeah, Kyle. I assume it's just going to be one-offs. I mean, like this thing with like Rusev, I think he's just, it's going to be a challenge of the month type situation with AJ is what I think it's going to be. You're, it's okay. It's this guy's turn. We'll heat this guy up, and he's the contender of the month, and we don't know. I mean, I, who, who do we assume is going to beat him? Miz, regardless? I mean, particularly if you're building towards Daniel Bryan, if – the traditional build is Miz somehow gets it, and like I could see like Daniel Bryan winning the Rumble if he resigns, and they make that like a Mania title match because that's the big money match on the SmackDown side. We've talked about that uh, and beaten that to a dead horse. I think this is just further proof that it would have made sense to have Miz win Money in the Bank. To have that hanging out there with AJ Styles would have been a good decision. Yeah, as much as like kind of lamented and poo pooed the traditional heel cash in, you know. Uh, they, they, that one would have been logical. That one would have been logical. Um, Braun is different, but I, you know, I, again, I, I don't know if Braun is popular as he is as a great champion. He's the Undertaker. He's Andre the Giant. He's not Hulk Hogan. He's not John Cena. I, I just, you know, Braun, you know, I, I don't think he's your traditional champion. I'm not sure. It would be interesting if, if they do go to him as champion, how that would work. Because he's not your tradition, the guy that you're, he's a semi mate. He's the guy you put second from the top. His match, um, he's gonna, I guess, gonna work Kevin Owens in a cage, according to local um, reports at Extreme Rules. I want to go back to that five way though, actually, or six way. Okay, so we know it's AJ and Rusev for that SmackDown title, but you know, whatever the Raw main event's murky. They're, they're doing this storyline. Oh, the match is off, and but they he heated up. Reigns Lashley and I said this last week I'm kind of digging that program a little bit but is it kind of look I know why they do a multi-person match because a you can have somebody who's not named Roman Reigns or Bobby Lashley take the fall and b you get a lot of guys on the card but I guess the only positive I could see is all right whichever of them doesn't win you could heat them up with like you could you could work a storyline and we're, like Drew McIntyre again was the name I floated out last week. He should be in that match and and maybe okay you, you do something with him and Reigns that ties into Ziggler and Rollins and you've got like a tag team type feud. Um, but I, I just feel like the multi person trope. Justin, you said it last week. We have we're coming off a of pay per view Money in the Bank, which is a multi person match. You have two of them. Um, 
The SmackDown show in March was a multi-person pay-per-view. You have the Elimination Chamber, which is a multi-person main event. Mm, you know, I, look, I might be the only one sitting in this uh, studio or table uh, that thinks this. I why not just do Reigns Lashley one on one? I think that would be far more intriguing than the multi-person match. Yeah, I kind of feel like actually that's where they're going, and I agree with you. They should. When you're talking about all these multi-person matches, I was thinking back to my childhood and playing wrestling video games, and I like virtually never, when you're going to like play with your friends or just playing by yourself, I would almost never choose to do a multi-man match. <laughs> Maybe this is a stupid correlation, but I don't li- I'm not a fan of them. I'd rather just have your standard singles match to determine a number one contender, especially if you're going to have five guys like Kyle, you went through the names last week of who you thought might be in the five way and it was super underwhelming and you know like a lot of those guys have zero chance of winning so i would personally i'd much rather see lashley reigns i agree like drew mcintyre is really to me again i'm gonna keep pushing that name because i think he's ready i think he's the only intriguing guy to be inserted in the picture like finn balor okay fine people like him particularly sitting at this table but (laughs) he's not winning uh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Const- the great Constable Corbin Justin would not win. Yeah. Uh, General Mahal with his namaste gimmick isn't winning. Uh, Bob Rude is not winning. Uh, Elias isn't winning. So- Bob Roop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There we go. Um, Puts last from the past. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the, the one-on-one, you know, people like kind of that thing, like, oh, one of these guys has to lose. I think that would almost draw more heat. Like, who would it be? But, um, and one other element we need to talk about, talking about how we perceive some of these guys. Um, and, and, you know, I always like to talk about kind of the, um, I don't know if hypocrisy is the right word, but I'll just say it because I'm drawing a blank else. Well, a lot of hypocrisy in American society yeah, these yeah. days. But did you guys see the thing that Heyman wrote on Facebook that obviously was the impetus for the Raw storyline, the long Facebook post? Was this about, about them unable to be able to make a contract? Yeah, but then he like, but it wasn't just that, but it was what he was saying about the other performers, the the, the quote alleged contenders on Raw. Yeah, I just skimmed it. So. Okay, I, I I could read it. I mean, it's really long. I mean, it's really long, as you can see, as I have it up here. Oh God. But if anyone if if anyone else writes that, he gets crushed. <laughs> besides Heyman, if anyone else just gets goes out, writes on Facebook and just crushes. The quote unquote full timers on Raw, no one's saying, Oh, what a what are the great promos back at it again. They're killing this guy if they say Brock Lesnar has no interest in the sloppy second Samoan. Bobby Lashley, the man who would be Lesnar, the supposed college standout who won the NAIA championship because he knew the competition for Division One was too fierce. By the way, remember when Bobby won NAIA title? No one really that no one really cared about. Brock was making national headlines, winning the D1 heavyweight championship. When Bobby saw Lesnar ascend to the biggest box office in the UFC, Bobby knew he had no chance, so he hid behind Scott Coker's tomato cans in Strike Force and Bellator, which is kind of funny, hoping to look good enough to graduate into once time once in a lifetime payday position. Again. Brock Lesnar, who had never heard of Bobby. Uh, and then and then there's Kurt Angle's Lesnarless roster members who will be forever practice the intellectual masturbation of thinking they are worthy of sharing the bill with the single biggest attraction, either WWE or UFC. This is funny, but again, if it's like, you know, if this is Hulk Hogan, I mean, if Facebook.com is in 1998 and Hulk Hogan goes vanilla midgets on the roster, I mean, the, the internet would blow a gasket. I, I mean, if I don't want to walk with Elias, I don't care who gets Braun Strowman's hands, don't know, don't want to know why Bobby Roode thinks he's glorious, no interest in witnessing Finn Balor prove he's the best in-ring performer on Raw, no inclination to watch Kevin Owens KO his mid-card status. I mean, again, if this is anybody, I mean, you know, people think, oh, it's Paul, it's great. Man, there's a lot of p- same people. If they write the same Facebook post, I mean, the usual gang on Twitter.com is going off on them. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Kevin Owens. That was a topic I wanted to talk about. Is Kevin Owens the greatest universal champion of all time? Oh, no. <laughs> I think there's no question, really. There, what, there's only been four universal champions, I believe, right? Finn for one day. Um, Lesnar. Goldberg and Kevin Owens. Goldberg is the best universal champion ever. (laughs) Kevin Owens is the greatest universal champion of all time, bar none. No argument. 
Oh God, oh, no, no, no. Disc- Guess who just wrote the term fake news to Dave Meltzer on Twitter.com as we're recording live. Your boy Glenn Gilberti, who is one of the shittiest podcast personalities in the United States of America, wrestling or otherwise. I mean, you talk about a guy who's just out to fucking lunch. <laughs> he, I, I'm just glancing at your screen, and I see I am the real deal. That's your boy, Disco Inferno. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fake news. That's the last post there. So he he's at it. He's joining in the feud with Dave. And uh, is this over there, Bischoff? Now Mark Madden's on there. Wow. Wait a minute. What is going on? I, this is this is all live to tape right now, guys. <laughs> we were browsing Twitter just seeing what's going on in the wrestling world. There is some crazy shit going on. <laughs> I guess I could probably be looking on my own screen rather than looking over Kyle's shoulder here, but uh wow. Is that his actual account? Yeah, seventeen thousand followers. That has to be his actual account. Okay. It actually is. Okay. I was wondering because somebody's like, This is a parody account. Hold on here. Okay, okay. He doesn't have the blue check mark because Twitter has no idea who Glenn Gilberti is. <laughs> yeah, no blue check mark. All right, I'm I'm completely losing my train of thought now. What were we talking about? <laughs> oh, Kyle. So you're talking about Heyman, and he was he was bashing uh, Bobby Lashley's college wrestling experience. Yeah. You understand where you are right now, right? You're in the capital of amateur wrestling in the United States, the state of Iowa. How does that feel? Are you an amateur wrestling fan? No. I'm not really either, but I, I recognize oh, the history of this state, yeah. yes. I, I mean, I don't have anything against it. I mean, I just, I'm not going to say that I you know follow the sport. Well, after we get done recording tonight, we are going to take Kyle out and about here in the uh, Waterloo, Iowa area, and we are going to take him to the hometown of Dan Gable himself, we're, Kyle, we're going to be just mere blocks from the George Tragos Luthez Hall of Fame. I think it's closed now, so you're not going to get to see it, but we're going to be very close to holy ground, my friend. How do you feel about that? <laughs> didn't, you, didn't you have a run-in with uh, Dave Meltzer there, by the way, one I time? I did. Dave was actually a very nice guy. Two oh, years ago, I think. oh, he was? I thought oh, he was a nice guy. Was a nice oh, that's not what you told me privately. <laughs> <laughs> I had had a few too many beers by the time I talked to him. I actually talked to him near the men's restroom, if I recall correctly. And uh, I don't think, speaking of men's restrooms, the brewery we're taking you to, Kyle, um, Justin had a run-in with a WWE superstar there. Justin, would you care to tell us who that was? Yeah. Uh, Kurt Angle's son, Jason Jordan. Uh, went in there, and he was washing his hands, finishing up, and it was right after uh, that angle had just started, so... I, I I didn't want to make too much conversation in a men's restroom, so I just told him I thought it was going really good and uh, enjoyed his work. Uh, he seemed very nice. Never know who you're going to run into in Waterloo, Iowa, Kyle. I have breaking news. Dave Meltzer's arguing with a fake de- Disco Inferno uh, <laughs> account. It actually is. Oh, he's, the, he's tweeting both of them, isn't he? From what I see here, that's a fake one. Yeah, and that's the one Dave's tweeting towards. <laughs> wow dave got worked on twitter.com <laughs> all right you guys can check that all out on twitter um just just check uh at dave Meltzer w-o-n there's there's a lot of drama going on uh did you guys watch nxt this week by the way i'm looking at justin's alistair black t-shirt anything going i mean i think nxt is maybe more interesting than the main roster television right now it's been a while since you could say that uh, yeah, but the main I'll roster is a little bit in a, in a rut right now no, I mean, the key is NXT is, you know, it's funny when I go back and I watch like Mid-South or something on the network. NXT TV reminds me a lot of watching Saturday morning wrestling or that in that it's an hour. It's easy to digest. It builds to big matches. You know, that's the goal. So, I mean, it's just because I think we hold the main the quote unquote main roster to a higher standard you know, NXT is able to get favorable. That's not to say that every takeover this year hasn't been completely out of this world because it has been. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, the three takeovers so far this year have been ridiculous, and I have every belief that Brooklyn will be as well with, you know, Chomp and Black main eventing. 
But um, no, I mean, I, I think that that's. Is it easier to digest, and that makes it "quote unquote" better? Yeah, I mean, I think the main roster is, you know, or like Raw and SmackDown, we'll just say, is it gets a lot of the most, it gets a lot of unfair criticism, is what I'm going to say. It really does. I think there, there, there's a lot of legit criticism for it. Yeah, the shows are long, but you know, you get a lot of good wrestling. Okay, the ending sucked on Raw, but Dolph and Rollins. I mean, there was a time. I mean. <laughs> You get a 30-minute match on television, okay, you know, the real Disco Inferno and his buddy Vince Russo, you didn't get 30 minutes of wrestling total in 1999, Raw. And, you know, I'm okay, and again, the end sucked, um, you know, and, and you risk kind of turning off the crowds when you do a 28-minute match to an odd finish, but you know, the ratings pattern held, so that was good, so it'll be interesting to see where the show does next week. Not that the ratings are that big of a deal anymore, but... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that was a great match you got on Raw. And you got the Team Hell No Reno. It's, it's fine. I have no I have no problem with Raw and SmackDown this week. So bringing up Raw and SmackDown compared to NXT, I can't help but think it's it's like Taco John's. You know, <laughs> we have a lot of Taco John's in the area, so we take it for granted like we do. You know, we get a lot of Raw and SmackDown in a week. You know, Kyle Kyle comes from uh, somewhere where there's not a lot of Taco Johns, and it is an effing treat to have some Taco Johns, and that is NXT. All I can say is I hope my wife left that one taco. I will eat it tonight when I get home, especially after we go out all night. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just pulled up the Taco Johns location. Oh. Just in eastern Iowa. Oh, okay. I mean, just dri- you do that drive down 35 South. I was in tears. <laughs> Every exit. Every exit, there was a fucking Taco John's. I was like, I can't believe that. There, I, I saw more Taco John's today than I had seen in my previous 38 years of existence. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, the only one in Ohio was, you know, <laughs> the one at my college, Ohio University. You're staying awfully close to one, Kyle. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're staying right there. There's the Taco John's. <sighs> I might walk tonight. <laughs> if, if, if it's late, who knows? Sometimes those are open late. Come on, man. Yeah, you got to keep stay up open late for the stoners, right? Uh, go, go ahead, Joseph. I was just going to say, add, uh, as far as NXT go, I, I didn't watch it. I, I like to treat NXT like Netflix. I like to binge watch all the tapings right before the, the takeover so it's all fresh. Yeah, or, or just like two, it's a two or three at a time. That's what I mean by easy to digest. You know, it's like you can watch three of them and it's lo- as long as, you know, one Raw. And, you know, it feels like a lot more has happened and it's easier to remember. It's just by design. I mean, you know, again, I, I actually don't think it's fair to compare the brands. I, I don't. I think they're set up for two totally different things. Um, I don't know what exactly NXT, the relationship with the main roster is bizarre because, you know, these guys get called up and they just lose. I mean, it's it, it's not, you know, the I, these guys aren't jumping. It's not like, you know, we talk about Eric Bischoff. We started off to bring it full circle. It's not like, you know, these guys show up from NXT and they're treated, you know, like in the Monday Night Wars days where they were just a star and got pushed right away. I mean, you know, poor Andrade C and Almas can't even get a match. Sanity lost on, on Tuesday. So, um, you know, this not, with not a lot of fanfare, hey, AOP showed up with a random squash out of nowhere. Um, but, yeah, I, I, that, that comparison's unfair, I think, to Raw and SmackDown. The fine people of Raw and SmackDown. They're, they're fine people on both sides of, of, of the main and NXT roster. <laughs> we know politics is going to come up at some point in this evening, fellas. We'll save that for the bars. <laughs> um, you know someone else who has been a little critical, though, of the writing on the television? Daniel Bryan. I'm reading a quote that was published today. Um, it's from a podcast he did in May, actually, but this was just published today. And they're asking him about a feud with The Miz. And he said, I quote, I am definitely up for it, but I will answer it with a question. Do you trust WWE with telling that story from now until WrestleMania 35? Like, what in the last several years has shown to you that something like that is possible here? Daniel Bryan said that on the, not to promote a rival show, the Gorilla Position podcast. Not really a rival. I'm sure they're quality individuals over there, but... uh, yeah, the Gorilla Position podcast. Daniel Bryan apparently said that. I do not listen to the Gorilla Position podcast. I Maybe I should. I'm getting Daniel Bryan on the show. So what do we make of this? Daniel Bryan throwing bombs at the writing team. You know, 
I'm trying to think of long-term really good storytelling and only two programs sprung to mind. And, and I'm almost probably definitely wrong, but Jericho Owens and uh, Champa Gargano are, are the only two I can think of. And uh, they kind of fell into both of those, just like, you know, the original Daniel Bryan authority story. That's, it's funny you mentioned the authority story because uh, the article here says the podcast host asked him or he responded and said WWE managed to pay off a long running story with Brian once before in his feud with the authority. Cause that went from SummerSlam to WrestleMania. And Brian said, quote, yeah, if something accidentally happens and yeah, they've got no control over it, it's possible that it can happen. So that's Brian giving the nod to the fans who he would still credit as kind of forcing WWE's hand heading into WrestleMania 30. I think that's a pretty shocking podcast interview by Daniel Bryan. I had not seen that until just right now. So I guess I guess that could lend some credibility to maybe he is looking out, outside the box about leaving WWE. We'll have to see what happens, but um, um, I don't know. It says later in this interview here, it said he followed up in the interview by saying he hopes the WWE creative team starts up the feud with Miz sooner Rather than later, he said, quote, I think that would be awesome. I think it would be something that the fans would be excited to see whether or not we can prolong because people want to see me punch Miz in the face. I want to punch Miz in the face. Whether we can prolong that on television for that period of time, I don't know. And end quote. That's kind of my question, too, is could they actually draw this out all the way until WrestleMania 35? And I'm not sure they could keep the interest that long. What do you think, Kyle? Yeah, they. Hmm. It depends how long they keep it on AJ, and then but the. <sighs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you can. I mean, I think people did want to see it a lot right away. You know, as much as we do, kind of champion long term storytelling. I almost wonder if it was a mistake not going right to it. You know, because it was real hot. People wanted, you know, when Angle came out and said, you know, oh, an old friend, you know, my old friend Daniel Bryan made one request and that, you know, Miz, that you be sent to SmackDown. And then, you know, I think we know now that big cast storyline was not exactly the most useful uh, use of Bryan's time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, honestly... What did that accomplish? Didn't, you know, Big Cass is gone from the company. Um, and, and we, I mean, we learned Daniel Bryan's, real, we didn't learn Daniel Bryan's real good. We got to see he was real good again. But, you know, that may not have been the, uh, you know, best best use. So, I don't, I, again, it all goes back to he's holding up, you know, just like Brock, you know. We don't know is Brock, you know. And, by the way, Meltzer's kind of joined in. He joined in this afternoon with PW Insider. And there is now, it seems like, legitimate that they may not do um, have Brock work SummerSlam. Breaking news. I mean, the worst world champion in WWE history, Brock Lesnar. It would almost be better, do you think, if they stripped him? Like what UFC happened, does. Like, the 30-day yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, just just strip true. him of it. Yeah. How many times do they do? Okay, that's a great point. How many times have they had a champion, they take the title off him because he's injured, and he winds up coming back you know, short enough time anyway, and they didn't need to take it off. Shawn Michaels, right? IC title, or yeah, the IC title is at ninety-five. Well, he goes, well, that was part. They use that for the storyline to get heat. Yeah. But I mean, there's probably been a dozen, or not a dozen, but like a few, a couple, a handful that have in the last couple years alone that I'm drawing blank on. But they could do it like the UFC, where they create like almost like an interim champion, and then Brock comes back, and there's your big match. You know, you strip Brock and Brock and. You know, he just, whoever winds up winning the universe title, it's just. This is mind blowing. Okay, think about this. If Brock goes from WrestleMania, doesn't work SummerSlam. He did work the greatest Royal Rumble. Yeah. A couple weeks after Mania. So he could go to like September, October, and you're talking like five or six months with one title defense. Crazy. I saw a stat because he just recently passed uh, CM Punk for the longest title run of. You know, this this era and the stat was something like in order for Brock Lesnar to have as many title defenses as CM Punk did in his run, he would have to be champion for like another hundred years. It was just it was something ridiculous like that. 
Yeah, I don't know. I <laughs> I cannot believe you would have this guy who's just obviously a special attraction champion not work SummerSlam, but I don't know. Maybe they think I there's no they mo- have, they maybe have a couple dates left, I guess, and they they but like, what date would be better than SummerSlam? You know, like some random. This is your biggest show. I mean, unless if well, there are these rumors floating around that they're going to do like an Undertaker. And I, your boy Brian Alvarez was floating this Undertaker against Cena in a rematch where Cena would, you know, like he know it's coming this time. Um, I mean, that's okay. Like, I don't mind when they do it. Like on these, Austra- you know, whether it's the Greatest Royal Rumble ever or the Australian Super Show, they're doing when they do like kind of blasts from the past. Tight matches, you know, they're going to do Triple H Undertaker, I guess, for the final time in Australia. I don't mind that, but, man, and here's another thing with Lesnar. It begs the question, why does each brand have to have a world title then if the one brand really doesn't have the world title? And you could keep AJ as a, tri- you know, I've always advocated, you know, you you the intercontinental, you, the U.S. title is kind of, a dead thing because like a W it's associated with WCW, I think. But if you had like the intercontinental and universal titles as the respective title, top titles of the brand and you had a traveling champion, you know, let's, we'll just say it's AJ for the time. Like he has fresher opponents. If you can go back and forth between raw and SmackDown, he's not psych. You know, you don't have to kind of protect him with like a lot of multi-person matches because you don't want to run through his like six contenders. So man, does it really go against the argument that both brands need a world champion when the one basically hasn't had one for one. three months. I, I just thought, I think it, how awesome would it be if uh, Roman Reigns won the title and then just never defended it, just put himself on the same schedule as Lesnar and get him over. <laughs> you have like Roman announced for a title match and he just like slowly, casually walks out on the Raw stage, flips off the fans and walks right to the back again. Ultimate heel heat right there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing on Raw. I honestly don't know what they're doing on SmackDown. But uh, I thought the Daniel Bryan stuff was interesting. So apparently, he doesn't have a lot of faith in the in the writing team and in telling a long term story. Um, I thought of another one they told, and I I cannot recall because we <laughs> got on some different topics. I was going to bring it up, but um, can't remember. Uh, anything else you guys want to throw out there this week before we wrap it up on our first ever live cast here We're all in the same place at the same time? I'm looking forward to going out and seeing the wonderful town here of Cedar Falls. I am too. This is a little bit shorter than our usual show. We're, we're almost at an hour though, but I'm not going to lie. This the, the whole thing with Kyle Ross coming to town here is I've been dying to take him out, out on the town. So that's what we're going to be doing here in just a second. Justin. Kyle's putting on his uh, I'm a Eric Bischoff guy shirt, so it's time to hit the town and get some apple teenies. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I think we are going to take it home. So we will be back next Thursday, I think, with the next edition of the Top Robe Nation podcast. Check us out on toprobenation.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever podcasts are found. Um, I haven't pumped our Twitter handles in a while. You can catch me at Historical Ryan. You can catch Kyle. Kyle, tell him where you can find me. At TRP Kyle. And Justin? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're at Justin Joint. I'm pretty sure. J O Y N T. N T. So, at Justin Joint. And uh, on that note, Kyle, it's time, my friend. Catch you guys next time. Taco Jones. Taco Jones is waiting. See you later.